Hello, and welcome to Elevator Pitch Series for the Radiographer. I am Michael, and this is the first video in the series on Special Radiographic Procedures. Special Radiographic Procedures are radiographic procedures that usually involve the use of contrast media. Multiple images are acquired at different stages of these procedures. With this use of contrast media and acquiring images at different stages, special radiographic procedures provide far more information about an anatomical part than a plain radiograph of that same part. We'll be starting out this series by looking at the special procedure, hysterosalpingography. And just like we'll be doing with all our special procedures, we'll be discussing hysterosalpingography under 11 major points. First, we'll be defining hysterosalpingography and discussing certain anatomical and pathological terms related to it. We'll also be looking at the indications and contraindications of this procedure. Then, we'll learn about the contrast media and equipment that are used for this procedure. We'll then move on to patient preparation and the preliminary film to be acquired before looking at the technique of hysterosalpingography and what films are to be acquired during the procedure. We then conclude with aftercare and complications of this procedure. Before we start, let us remind you that this is a special procedure that involves acquiring two or more images at different stages. Now, even though these images look different due to contrast media, the positioning used to acquire them is pretty much the same set of projections that you have been taught in radiographic positioning. To keep this set of videos short, we will not be discussing the positioning and centering points of the projections involved. What we'll do is that at the beginning of each video, we'll provide a list of projections that are used in the procedure. If you are not very familiar with a listed projection, try to read about it in your positioning textbook before moving further in the video. This will help you understand the procedure better. That takes us to hysterosalpingography. In this procedure, there is one projection that you should be familiar with, the supine anterior posterior view of the pelvis. Check that you know how to position a patient for this and the direction and centering of the beam. Do you know it? Let's roll. The beauty about big words is that by merely breaking them down into two or more smaller words, you can get an idea of what they mean. Hysterosalpingography is made up of three words that are coined from ancient Greek and 19th century Latin. Hystero, salpingo, and graphi. Hystero simply refers to the uterus, salpingo refers to the salpinges, more commonly known as the fallopian tubes, and graphi, like you probably already know, means the study of something. When you put all this together, you'd figure out that hysterosalpingography is basically the study of the uterus and fallopian tubes. You can now beef up this definition into something more standard by saying, hysterosalpingography is the radiological investigation of the uterus and fallopian tubes, in which contrast media is injected into the uterus, while fluoroscopic or radiographic images are taken. To better understand why and how hysterosalpingography is performed, let us look a bit at the anatomy of the female reproductive system. First the ovaries. There are normally two ovaries, one on each side of the body. The ovaries are made up of different structures which perform different functions. But in this video, we are interested in its internal cortex, which contains many tiny seed-like structures, called ovarian follicles, indicated by the red arrows. The yellow structure within each follicle is called an ovum, or an egg. At different times, these follicles develop into something known as a graphian follicle, circled in yellow. This is a mature follicle that is so big that it eventually ruptures at the surface of the ovary. This causes its ovum to be released from the ovary, as seen circled in green. This release of the ovum from the ovary is called ovulation, and it occurs once in every menstrual cycle. The released ovum moves to the nearest fallopian tube. That takes us to the fallopian tubes. They are also paired. They connect each ovary to the uterus. Each fallopian tube has three distinct parts, the infundibulum, ampulla, and isthmus. These parts are important to reproduction. You see, the infundibulum is the part closest to the ovary. It is shaped like a funnel and has certain finger-like projections called fimbri. These fimbri help to capture the ovum or egg that has been released from the ovary. The egg then moves from the infundibulum to the ampulla, where it stays for some time, waiting for a sperm cell from a male partner to fertilize it. At this point, either of two things can happen. First, if no sperm comes to fertilize the egg, it moves to the uterus where it breaks down and then menstruation starts. Alternatively, if a sperm comes to the ampulla to fertilize the egg, the fertilized egg moves to the uterus to implant there, and the gestation or pregnancy phase starts. And now the uterus. This is where the fertilized egg implants and develops over a period of months into a cute baby. 
We should point out that the vagina and cervix are the passageways from outside to the uterus. So far, we have looked a bit at the anatomy of the female reproductive system. Take note that we only focused on the details that would be relevant to hysteris alpingography. There is generally a whole lot on the ovaries, fallopian tubes, and uterus that was not discussed. With all that has been said on the anatomy of the female reproductive system, it is clear that the fallopian tubes are important to the passage of the egg from the ovary to the uterus. You would agree that if there were an obstruction in the fallopian tubes, this process would be disrupted. The sperm and egg would be unable to meet at the ampulla for fertilization, and even if they do, the fertilized egg will be unable to move to the uterus for implantation. This means that the woman will be unable to have a normal pregnancy. Suspected obstruction is one of the major reasons for hysteris alpingography. By injecting contrast media into the uterus and fallopian tubes, images can show if a tube is potent or blocked. Why is hysteris alpingography carried out? Like we have already mentioned, suspected obstruction is a major indication for HSG. An obstruction and other problems would cause infertility. Primary infertility is when a female of reproductive age, who has never been pregnant, is unable to get pregnant after at least one year of sexual intercourse without any method of contraception. On the other hand, secondary infertility is when a female of reproductive age, who has been pregnant at least once, is unable to get pregnant again after at least one year of sexual intercourse without any method of contraception. Secondly, because a hysterosalpinogram shows the position, shape, and size of the female reproductive organs, it is also used to investigate congenital and acquired abnormalities of the system. These include bicornuate uterus, a congenital abnormality in which there are two uterine cavities instead of one, unicornuate uterus, another congenital abnormality in which only one half of the uterine cavity forms, uterine fibroids, an acquired abnormality in which non-cancerous growths or tumors are found within or around the uterus, Asherman syndrome, another acquired abnormality in which scar tissue is formed inside the uterus, causing its walls to adhere to each other, and so on. Another reason for hysteris alpingography is to investigate recurrent miscarriages. Also, hysteris alpingography is performed after surgery on the fallopian tubes to see if it was successful. A good example of these surgeries is the female tubal ligation, which is carried out as a permanent means of preventing pregnancy. We have looked at reasons for requesting a hysteris alpingography. Now, when do you not perform one? First is pregnancy. HSG should never be carried out on a patient who is known or suspected to be pregnant. In fact, pregnancy must be ruled out before a HSG is performed. This is because the procedure is invasive and will most likely abort any fetus that is present in the uterus. It is also contraindicated in patients with urogenital tract infection. The procedure would spread and worsen an infection. It should also not be performed if the patient has just recently had an invasive procedure like an abortion, dilatation and curatage, or even a recent hysteris alpingography. This is because these procedures cause some level of trauma to the soft tissue. When recently performed, healing is not complete, and there is a risk of venous intravasation of contrast media, if HSG is performed at this time. As for contrast media, a volume of 10 to 20 milliliters of either highest molar or lowest molar contrast media is used. It should have an iodine concentration of about 300 mg of iodine per milliliter. Next up, the equipment and instruments used for hysteris alpingography. First is the image production and patient support unit. Hysteris alpingography is commonly carried out with a fluoroscopic unit. This uses a fluoroscopic screen to acquire images continuously. Think of it like a live video recording, but with X-ray images. With this technology, the radiologist can observe on the monitor activity in the uterus and fallopian tubes as the procedure is going on. The tube is usually placed under the couch in fluoroscopy, with the fluoroscopic screen above the couch. This is because, to produce continuous images like in a video, the tube is made to continuously expose in fluoroscopy. Now, the radiologist performing the procedure is in near the couch while this is happening. With the tube under the couch, less radiation reaches the radiologist and any other member of staff nearby. When fluoroscopy is not available, the conventional radiography unit is less commonly used. Images are not continuously produced in this unit. This means the radiologist cannot observe the procedure as it goes on. This makes use of conventional radiography and HSG more difficult and more likely to cause error. As you know, the tube is above the couch in this unit, with the image receptor place in a bucky below the couch surface. Next is the speculum. This is used to dilate the vagina. Another instrument is the forceps. 
There are several types of forceps used in medical practice. Two common ones you'll find in hystericalpingography include the volcellum forceps and the sponge holding forceps. The volcellum forceps are used to grip the cervix during the exam for stability. The have hooked blade tips designed to minimize trauma to the soft tissue of the cervix while providing a secure grip. The sponge forceps or sponge holding forceps are used to handle cotton swabs and sponges while cleaning. They have rounded blade tips. Next is the cannula. There are several types of cannulas used in hystericalpingography. One example is the Leach Wilkinson cannula. A syringe containing 10 to 20 mg of contrast media is attached to its lower end, while its tip is inserted into the cervix for injection of contrast media. Now, how is a patient prepared for hystericalpingography? As a special examination, HSG is not usually done on the spot. The patient comes on a prior date to book an appointment. During booking, the procedure is explained to the patient, all her questions are answered, and she is given certain important instructions, one of which is to avoid sexual intercourse from that day till after her appointment date. The patient's appointment is usually scheduled between 10 and 14 days after her menstruation has started. This is the time just before ovulation, when the patient is least likely to be pregnant. Also, at this point, menstruation is well over, and the uterine tissue has healed from the bleeding. This makes it less likely for the patient to experience pain and other complications due to contrast media intravasation. Lastly, the patient is asked if she is allergic to any substances, especially iodine, which is found in most contrast media. If she is allergic, the best alternative for the situation is considered. The patient is then handed a consent form which re-explains the procedure and contains a section where the patient signs that she fully understands the procedure and she agrees to go through with it. Next is the preliminary film. In special radiographic procedures, the preliminary film or preliminary image is the first image acquired before the procedure starts. This means that it is acquired before contrast media is introduced. It is also known as a control film. In hysterosalpingography, the preliminary film is a cone down anterior posterior or posterior anterior projection of the pelvis with the patient's supine. You're most likely familiar with the anterior posterior projection. In this case, the patient assumes the same position for both the AP and PA projections. What determines which is used is the equipment that is available. If an undercouch fluoroscopy unit is used, the direction of the beam as you can see on the diagram is from the posterior aspect of the pelvis to the anterior, giving a PA projection, even though the patient is lying supine. On the other hand, if an overcouch conventional radiography unit is used, the patient will still lie supine for the procedure. Thus, the beam moves from the anterior pelvis to the posterior, giving an AP projection. It doesn't matter which is used, they both appear alike. We should also emphasize that it is a cone down view of the pelvis. This means that the beam is collimated to exclude most of the pelvic bones that are seen in a regular pelvis x-ray. This is because there is no interest in those areas during hystericalpingography. Thus, by collimating or conning, the patient is protected from excess radiation. Now we look at how a hysterosalpingography is performed. On the day of her appointment, the patient takes off all clothing and changes into a clean radiolysin gown. She assumes a lithotomy position on the fluoroscopic or radiographic table. This position involves her lying supine with her knees flexed and legs abducted, as seen on the diagram. Then, the radiologist lubricates and places the speculum in the vagina to dilate it, making it whiter for the radiologist to insert the cannula. Before inserting the cannula, the vagina and cervix are cleaned with antiseptic-soaked cotton swabs. Now, the cannula which is attached to a syringe of contrast media is inserted into the cervix. If fluoroscopy is used, the radiologist observes on the monitor as he or she slowly injects the contrast media into the uterus. A spot image is taken as the uterus and tubes fill up. The injection continues until contrast media spills out of the tube into the peritoneum, indicating that there is no obstruction. Another spot film is taken at this point of peritoneal spill. Of course peritoneal spill will only happen when the tube is patent. The major reason for failing to observe peritoneal spill is an obstruction in the fallopian tube that prevents contrast media from spilling out. Other less common causes of failed peritoneal spillage include using too little contrast media, an enlarged uterus due to fibroids, and taking the image too early, a common problem when conventional radiography units are used.
As already stated, the projection you would almost always find in use for his terrace alpingography is the anterior-posterior or posterior-anterior supine projection of the pelvis, depending on whether the tube is under couch or over couch. Throughout the procedure, the images are taken at least twice. As the uterus and tubes fill up, and when peritoneal spillage occurs. Don't forget one image is also taken as a control before starting the procedure. After his terrace alpingography exam has been performed and all equipment removed from the vagina, the area is cleaned, and the patient is handed a menstrual pad to absorb the slight bleeding that is likely to occur after this procedure. The patient is not advised to operate a vehicle or go home alone. Occasionally pain medications and antibiotics are advised. We now conclude with the complications that commonly occur due to this procedure. First is pain, which can be due to the trauma of the instruments used or injection of contrast media. Bleeding is also experienced as a result of this trauma. Also, symptoms like nausea, vomiting and headache can occur due to the contrast media. That concludes this video on hysteris alpingography. We look forward to your questions and comments in the comments section or via email. If you love this video and would want more content, please subscribe and share with your colleagues. Until next time, do enjoy the learning process and take care.